Hello, young scholars, and welcome to yet another podcast on various topics in AP World and European history. Today, we need to discuss the reign of Napoleon Bonaparte. Now, surely you will recall that in France in the 1790s, this is the situation. We've been having this revolution that started in 1789 that was brought on by, uh, one might say, the impotence of Louis XVI's government, the economic problems which he seemed to be unable to to stem the tide of his inability to get the nobility to go along with financial reform and and also these new sort of enlightenment ideas that are driving people to think that absolute monarchy may not be the way to go. Uh, And and that revolution, obviously, by the time we get to the late 1790s, has led to about a decade of uh, really some very unpleasant times for for France. The, The economic problems became more acute. They, were, they found themselves at war with most of the rest of Europe, but with their perennial uh, enemy in Great Britain, and then also with the Prussians, the Austrians, the Russians, and, and, and so forth and so on. Uh, and so it is, it is into this, this world that suddenly this little corporal from, from the island of Corsica steps, steps into play. And we'll go back and sort of very briefly recap his, his early life before we continue. Uh, Napoleon is born in 1769 to parents who were actually uh, Corsican freedom fighters. They had been involved in trying to eject the uh, French who had recently conquered the island from their from their homeland. Uh, but uh, when Napoleon was young, his father basically took a if you can't beat them, join them sort of attitude and got involved in the Corsican government got involved in, in, uh, in the, the, uh, the body that was being asked to go to France to assist Louis in running the Corsican government, sort of like a, a parlement uh, of, of nobles in, in, in France. And while he is spending time at, at Versailles, he manages to secure for his son Napoleon a scholarship to one of the French military academies. And this was was considered a really fantastic opportunity for Napoleon because his family was well to do but they didn't have a lot of money and and so this is an opportunity that that probably they could not have provided him out of their own pocket now Napoleon was short but he was fiercely intelligent he was looked down on by his classmates not only because he was poor and most of them were, were sort of from the nobility and had these sort of lustrous titles and so forth, but also because he was Corsican. He didn't speak French real well. He was real serious. He didn't seem to have a great deal in the way of social graces. And so they, uh, you know, they kind of picked on him and gave him a hard time about his, about his height, about his nationality and so forth. And, and he, he didn't much, much care for them either. And his, uh, his instructors were aware of the fact that he was very, very bright, but not anybody necessarily anticipated that he was going to be this great figure because, again, like, he, he doesn't know the right people, he's not from the right family, you know, and that sort of thing was still very, very important in uh, France during the Ancien Régime. Now, the, the revolution is really going to afford Napoleon the opportunity to, to change all of that. He uh, became a Jacobin, and so as such, he was supporting that more left-wing branch of the revolution that is eventually going to call for uh, France to become a republic. But Napoleon uh, never really gets himself onto the main stage like, say, a Maximilien Robespierre or a Georges Danton or a Jean-Paul Marat. He stays in the back, sort of off to the side, in the wings. He avoids the limelight until we get to about 1795. And this is after the Thermidorian reaction, uh, where the Jacobins have kind of been been pushed out. Uh, but Napoleon is called upon as a young artillery officer to find some kind of way to stop this royalist revolt that was taking place in Paris. And he subsequently wields his cannons into the streets of Paris and fires into these uh, these rebels and defeats them. He is then sent to uh, participate in the recapture of the port city of Toulon from some royalists and from the British Navy, which he 
uh, in spite of the fact that his his commanders don't really believe that he's very capable, he manages to launch this very fearsome attack in which he's actually wounded that subsequently uh, allows the French to retake the city. And so so suddenly this this country, which you'll remember, is having all this financial trouble and all this instability and is in all these wars. They're sort of starving for a hero. And suddenly Napoleon is able to become that hero. And he's he's suddenly the the toast of Paris because of his his victories on behalf of the revolutionary government. Now, in uh, in 1796, Napoleon uh, does a couple of things. One, he gets married to a woman named Josephine. Okay. Josephine was a, not necessarily a, a hugely wealthy woman, but she was definitely a member of the Paris upper crust. She had been the wife of a member of the National Assembly who had been killed, so she was a widow with, with uh, some young children. And she was also the lover of one of the directors, so she was very well connected politically. And she also sort of, you know, she knew everybody in uh, in the, the various salons in, in, in Paris. She... Uh, she knew all the right people. She she went to you know went to everybody's parties and, and and so forth. And so she was definitely a a lady of high society. And Napoleon seems to have really found in her all the qualities he was looking for. He fell madly in love with her, and uh, and asked her to marry him. And she was actually originally fairly lukewarm about the whole thing, because. Uh, she felt like, you know, he doesn't have much of a sense of humor, he doesn't have a lot of social graces, but on the other hand, he was he was a war hero, he was suddenly very popular in Paris, He his star was on the rise, she recognized that, and she saw him as a stable future and protection for herself and, and her children in this very sort of tumultuous time. That's one thing that happens to Napoleon in 1796. The other thing that happens is Napoleon is called to take command of the French army in northern Italy. Now, up to this point, the war in uh, northern Europe has been going okay. Uh, you know, the French have made some gains in the Austrian Netherlands and in some of these German states uh, along the Rhine River. But things in Italy for the last year or so have not been going very well. They're getting pushed around by the Kingdom of Piedmont. They're being pushed around by the Austrians. And so when Napoleon shows up, the army is not in very good shape. They're demoralized, they're low on supplies, uh, they're not very well disciplined, and Napoleon really turns out to be the man of the hour. He gets in there, he reorganizes, he wins a couple of big victories against the Austrians, and, and really surprises everybody with his ability to, um, you know, find ways to win the battles that everybody else would have thought were unwinnable. And so by the time we get into 1797, he amazingly defeats the Austrians and basically forces them to sue for peace. And he conducts that, uh, that, that, those peace talks with Austria independent of the directory in, in Paris, which I think is demonstrative of two things. First of all, the fact that Napoleon has this sort of consummate belief in his abilities that some people would argue uh, was uh, a, type of, a type of hubris. Um, but uh, it is also demonstrative of the fact that the directory was really not not functioning properly as as a governing body of France. They allowed one of their generals to get away with sort of dictating policy on his own. Now, uh, one of the uh, the other really interesting things uh, about Napoleon during this period is he uh, is a, getting a great deal of loyalty from his troops, in part because. As a result of this peace that he uh, gets out of the Austrians, he forces the Austrians to pay France a subsidy, and he forces them to pay it directly to him. And he takes that money and uses it to pay his troops. And this is the first solid pay that they've seen in, in months, because again, the directory isn't collecting taxes, eventually they're, they're a big mess. Um, so he not only is a, a man who's bringing the French army victory, but he's making sure they get paid regularly, and so they are far more willing to support him than they are anybody else. As a consequence, in 1799, when people start saying, oh, pardon me, I, we, have, we have to go backwards. In 1798, Napoleon actually manages uh, to set up a new, a new war. 
he says, uh, okay, we, our big problem, since we've sort of taken care of the Austrians, our big problem now is the British, and in particular the, the British on the seas. Their navy is dominating us all of the time. They, uh, they have access to all of this international trade. That's, that's sort of England's lifeline. If we can cut that off, we can force the British to sort of give up. And so he uh, sets out on, on his own, of his own volition, really without the support of the directory, he gets his army together and he sets out from southern France and sails down to Egypt, which was controlled by the, the Ottoman Empire. And while he is in Egypt, he takes the city of Alexandria, and then he takes the city of Cairo, and he subsequently starts working his way east and north into uh, what is the current nation of Israel. He captures the city of, of Jaffa, um, but he's unable to capture the city of Acre. And, and so, and, and then around the same time, the British Navy under uh, Admiral, Admiral Nelson, uh, Lord Admiral Horatio Nelson, sails down into the Mediterranean and defeats Napoleon here at the Battle of the Nile. So Napoleon, despite the fact that he has these enormous tactical successes that nobody thought were possible, really finds himself in an untenable position in, uh, in Egypt. Um, however, I think that we should not necessarily write Napoleon's venture in Egypt off as a failure because of the fact that he took with him a number of scientists and artists because they, they wanted to study ancient Egyptian culture and they wanted to study the pyramids and the Sphinx and so forth and so on. And so they learned a great deal. And, and obviously their most lasting important discovery has been that of the Rosetta Stone, which subsequently allowed Egyptologists to translate Egyptian hieroglyphs and, and has formed really a lot of the basis of our understanding of ancient, yeah, ancient Egyptian culture. Um, so Napoleon manages in, in 17, late 1798 to get back to France. And despite the fact that ultimately his invasion of Egypt failed to sort of choke off the British Empire the way that he had hoped, again, it, 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 kept, his, it kept his name in the papers. Uh, it, 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 kept, uh, it kept his, his star sort of on the rise because everybody's going, wow, not only was he able to bring us victory in Italy, but he's invaded Egypt. Uh, he, he won these battles that nobody thought he could win. He humbled the Ottoman Empire. This guy is fantastic. And so in 1799, as the directory becomes less and less capable of running the country effectively, and uh, people are starting to plan for this coup. They say, okay, if we're going to do this coup and we're going to overthrow the directory, we've got to have the support of Napoleon because he's popular with the people, he's popular with the army, we're going we're gonna to need his backup. And once they get Napoleon involved in that coup, he basically takes over and starts running the show. And so in 1799, when he overthrows the directory, he establishes a new government in which he is the sole sort of executive figure in France, the consul, and the government is called the consulat, okay? So under the consulat, uh, Napoleon is a powerful executive, and he starts appointing his brothers and relatives to important government positions, making them minister of the interior and so forth. And when he begins to sort of expand his influence abroad, he'll actually put them in charge of a lot of these new areas that he takes over as governors or as kings. Uh, he also appoints a number of prefects to the various departments, the sort of states in France. And uh, those prefects, in a lot of ways, are very similar to the Intendant that we saw under Louis XIII and Louis XIV, except for they have a great deal more power and authority to sort of enforce Napoleon's will. Uh, this is certainly not the, the government that, say, the National Assembly of 1789 envisioned. It is, it is not... A, a republic. It is very much uh, a dictatorship in, in, in a lot of ways. Um, so Napoleon passes a new constitution that, while it is very authoritarian, at least has the uh, has some elements of universal suffrage to it, which makes him very popular with sort of the Jacobins and the far left, because we are again uh, Napoleon is bringing in this uh, this new stability. But he's also sort of defending the reforms of the revolution by, you know, male suffrage, everybody's equal, all that sort of thing. And the saying with which Napoleon describes his government is, authority from above, confidence from below. 
uh, the power to propose legislation is concentrated in these executives, uh, you know, primarily Napoleon and, and his ministers. But there is a, a legislative body of, of elected individuals who theoretically have a role to play in the government. Uh, and, and, and again, primarily because it's providing st stability and it's getting things done. And France has been so screwed up for the last decade or so, people are pretty much willing to go along with it. Napoleon also brings back the old calendar. He gets rid of the sort of new months and all that stuff that was left over from the cult of the supreme being. And he signs a concordat with Pius VII, the Pope, or Pius VII, uh, which basically brings France back into the fold with the Catholic Church, right? Because we remember under Robespierre, they had officially tried to de-Christianize the country. Napoleon undoes all that. And he and the Pope work out an arrangement that basically makes the French Catholic Church sort of Gallican. It's very much like it was under uh, under the Bourbon monarchs. The uh, lands of the church that were lost during the revolution are kept by the state. But Catholicism becomes the official religion of France. And... Uh, the French government agrees to pay the salaries of the various priests and archbishops and so forth, and the Pope has final say on appointing uh, bishops within within France. So the government still very much controls the sort of flow of money and political power within the church, but Catholicism is reestablished uh, in France, and, and the Pope is, is given a role to play in that, and that's sort of the deal that they work out. Now, at the same time, Again, in, in Napoleon's extension of the sort of the intent of the revolution, he also uh, provides in the new constitution religious toleration for Jews and Protestants. And while all this is going on, he's staying very busy. Supposedly during his reign, he dictated about 80,000 letters. Now, we need to move on to looking at Napoleon's early foreign policy, because uh, as you recall, we're, we're still at war with most of Europe. The Austrians declared war again, and so he was forced to march back in 1801, although now he is going uh, as, as sort of the, the head of the, the French state. He defeats them again and forces them to sort of give up in, in 1801. This is during the second coalition, by the way. The first coalition was uh, had been made against France by Prussia and Austria earlier when King Louis was still alive. And the Russians, meanwhile, were fighting with the Ottomans in the in the Balkans and in Eastern Europe. So they were really in no position to get involved. Uh, and so the British basically said, you know, we're kind of all on our own here. And so they they made a very tenuous peace treaty with Napoleon in 1802 and and when he when he made that treaty with the british uh some of the onlookers supposedly said we're at war or pardon me we're at peace this week but we'll be at war again next month because everybody understood that this peace treaty hadn't really solved anything the british and the french were still very much at odds and still really um dealing with some pretty severe conflict of interest between them and that was not really solved by the treaty. So the treaty was really just more of a cessation of hostilities. Meanwhile, Napoleon goes into the, this area in northern Europe, the sort of the bank of the Rhine. He chops up much of what's left of the Holy Roman Empire and either absorbs those states into France or makes them protectorates of France with some sort of at least nominal autonomy. <clears throat> and uh, he... He also establishes republics in Italy and in Switzerland and executes a member of the Bourbon family without trial because you remember one of our prime rules of European history is never leave a legitimate heir alive. And in 1804, Napoleon basically enshrines himself in his position of power in France when he is made emperor. He even goes so far as to force the Pope to come to Paris from Rome, which was seen as rather scandalous. And then when the Pope comes to, to crown him, he actually takes the crown out of the Pope's hands and puts it on his own head, which again, very, very scandalous. And in this very famous painting here, we see Napoleon about to crown his wife Josephine as his empress. And then here, in another very famous image, we have Napoleon as the emperor in the robes of state, in some ways looking very much like a Bourbon monarch with the ermine fur 
and so forth, but also very much recalling the image of, say, Julius Caesar, uh, who he often compared himself to. We've got the eagle here. We've got the very sort of Roman looking throne in the background is sort of an example of neoclassicist art, the laurel wreath here, uh, looking very sort of military and, and, and very stoic. And I think um, we can probably think of him as being a figure who sort of fits in with Caesar. He was a, a military man who rose to political power during a time of, of political unrest. He made some sweeping reforms. He won a number of great victories. He made himself uh, dictator, in a sense, which Napoleon technically was declared consul for life, and, and then subsequently, uh, in, in 1802, and then subsequently in 1804, he becomes emperor. But their, uh, their paths to power do seem to run on some of, something of a, a parallel course. Now, uh, during this period, <clears throat> Napoleon is continuing to fight in, in Europe and, and, and elsewhere. He sends troops to Haiti to attempt to retake the island from the slave revolt that was taking place there, which we talked about. And unfortunately, his troops have trouble with the tropical disease and also with their constant enemy, the British Navy. And so they actually fail to retake the island and supposedly in frustration, Napoleon said, damn sugar, damn coffee, and damn the colonies. Uh, and, 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 you know, sort of stormed, frustrated through the palace, thinking about the troops that he had lost and how badly he could have used them uh, back, in, back in Europe. At the same time, he also sells the Louisiana Territory to the United States in order to raise money for his wars in Europe, and also hoping that as the United States became bigger and more powerful, that it would serve as a rival to the British in, uh, in, in their, their trade in the Atlantic Ocean, which, in fact, subsequently they, they sort of would, and obviously that's going to lead to the War of 1812 between the United States and Great Britain, which is going to cost the Great Britain troops and time and money that it could otherwise have spent fighting against Napoleon. So in some ways, uh, it was a win-win for, for both parties. Meanwhile, in Europe proper, we'll, uh, we'll, go, we'll go back to our, our map up here, we've got a new coalition against Napoleon. Okay, this is the fourth coalition. This is in 1804-1805. And this coalition is made up of Great Britain and Austria and also Russia. Now, Napoleon has been wanting to, to get rid of the British for a long time, right? We, we talked about the fact he's fighting them at Toulon. He's having to deal with them thwarting his invasion in Haiti. You know, he really wants to get the British. And so his army is actually stationed here in northern France. He's trying to move naval resources from, uh, from the Mediterranean around Iberia up to the Channel so that he can, he can use his navy to sort of fend off the British navy while he lands his troops. Unfortunately, as he is moving his, uh, his naval forces, and actually those of Spain with whom he was allied, uh, there is a naval battle at Trafalgar when the fleet is leaving the port of Cadiz, and uh, his old naval nemesis, Lord Admiral Horatio Nelson, defeats the combined French-Spanish fleet, uh, despite the fact that he himself is killed, which he had led quite a hard life in the Navy. He had already lost one eye and one arm and a number of his teeth. Uh, Nelson defeats the... French and Spanish Navy, he crushes them, and so Napoleon basically has to call his invasion off because he doesn't have the ships that he needs to uh, protect his transports while they're going across the channel. So instead, okay, if I can't get the British, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into Central Europe and I'm going to deal with the Austrians and the Russians. And so he marches into Central Europe. And meanwhile, Prussia, up to this point, has not really gotten involved, right? They're kind of waiting in the wings, waiting to see who's going to come out on top before they decide what they're going to do. And Napoleon knows, okay, I need a big win here. Because if I lose, first of all, I, I'm going to need to raise a new army. But second of all, that's going to encourage the Prussians to get involved. So in, uh, in Central Europe over here, he fights a battle at a place called Austerlitz against the combined forces of... Tsar Alexander I of Russia and the Austrian Habsburgs. 
And in this battle, which, hold on, we're going to run down here for a moment. Uh, in this battle at Austerlitz, uh, Napoleon wins probably what is his, his biggest and most stunning victory. He has his forces arrayed between these two towns and down in a low-lying area, which is sort of wreathed in fog in the early morning. He hides a couple of divisions. He then... Uh, basically makes it look like his right flank is very, very weak and convinces the Austrians and the Russians to sort of send a bunch of their forces all the way over here to try and attack them. And while that is happening, he takes his forces that have been hidden in the fog, he drives up through the center of the Austrian and, and Russian battle lines and splits them in half, breaks them, and, and basically completely destroys their armies. And, and after this, they are actually forced at the Treaty of Tilsit to sue for, for peace. And, and, and this, is a, this is a big, big deal for a couple of reasons. First of all, during this period, the, the, the Prussians had sort of uh, gotten, gotten involved in the war. This is 1806, 1807. And Napoleon beats up on them, having destroyed the Austrian and the Russian armies, and occupies the city of Berlin. And then by the Treaty of Tilsit, he, uh, first of all, makes himself equal with the other emperors. In fact, they met uh, on a raft in the middle of a river that was exactly between the two armies. Um, and the Russians and the Austrians have to make some pretty big concessions. First of all, Russia has to agree to become Napoleon's ally. They have to agree to participate in his continental system, which we're going to talk about shortly. The Prussians have to give up a little bit of territory. The Austrians have to give up a little bit of territory uh, in sort of Western and Central Europe. And so, and they also have to join the continental system. And so basically, by the time this is all said and done, Napoleon's empire looks like this. It includes France, it includes most of Italy, Central Europe, and then parts of sort of Eastern Europe running up to the, the Russian border, either directly controlled by him or controlled by people like Prussia, Russia, Austria-Hungary, who were his allies. This is the biggest empire that we've seen since the Romans. And meanwhile, the British, who don't really have a significant land army to speak of, are, are sort of stuck watching from the ocean uh, where their navy is supreme, but unable to really do anything big to, to stop what's going on on the continent. So that's the Treaty of Tilsit in 1807. Um, also, since uh, I, I sort of skipped over it, I do want to go back and look at uh, Napoleon um, as sort of a propagandist, right? This is a period during which not only is he winning these stunning victories against France's enemies, but he's also doing a really good job of portraying himself as, you know, France's glory boy, as France's savior, as the guy who's who's going to sort of solve all of France's woes, the guy who's bringing France to these new unlimited heights of glory, and part of the way that's being done is through paintings like this one. Uh, this is a painting by a gentleman named David, and it shows Napoleon obviously astride this, this horse as he crosses the Alps, and you'll also notice in the bottom, which we'll go to the next part of the frame here, uh, that his name is carved into this rock alongside that of Hannibal and Charlemagne. So he's he's showing himself to be this sort of great military leader who's on par with, with sort of the greats of the past. He's obviously looking very heroic and, and very in control and everything. So all the while that he's written this new constitution and is uh, sort of stabilizing the French economy and the French political system and winning these stunning battlefield victories and extending France's power all through Central Europe. He's also doing a very good job of portraying himself as sort of the savior of, of, of the French people, for lack of a better way of putting it. So after 1807, the Treaty of Tilsit, France under Napoleon is, is really at its, at its high point. The, the sort of uh, the plunder that they've been able to take from these other countries is allowing the French economy largely to to recover. Politically, things are very, very stable. They're they're doing real well on the battlefield. Things are things are just going going great. Um, now that is not to say, of course, that everybody was happy. We we discussed in, in class the fact that uh, when Napoleon starts invading uh, Austria, when he starts killing members of the Bourbon family to solidify his position on the throne, 
some people start to see him as a tyrant. Uh, Ludwig von Beethoven was a great example of that. We talked about the fact that he originally dedicated his third symphony to Napoleon. Um, but after he started to see Napoleon as, as a tyrant, as a dictator, as sort of this evil military monster, he scratched his name off the symphony and renamed it the Eroica instead. Um, however, despite all of that, I mean, things are looking good for France, right? They've managed to sort of stave off these enormous coalitions that have come against them. The army is strong. They're loyal. Everything's, everything's going good. Um, and so, so during this time is, is really when Napoleon is going to, to go home and going to do a lot of his, uh, really a lot of his best, his best work in terms of uh, sort of his domestic policies. This is the, the point during which, uh, first of all, the, the French army has become more organized. It's become very large due to the Levee en masse. And actually, the Levee en masse has become sort of the standard for most European states in terms of uh, really making war one of the great aims of, of the state. And not just war, but sort of total war in which every man is eligible for the draft. We're producing much larger armies, and therefore we need to come up with new ways of organizing them and supplying them and, and so forth. Napoleon divides up his army into these, these corps, and each corps, uh, that's C-O-R-P-S, it's the French word for, for body. Uh, each corps has its own cavalry, its own artillery, and so forth and so on, so that, so that it can function independently if need be. It has a very tight-knit command structure. <clears throat> the uh, you know propaganda is also becoming a very very big part of European politics as you know Napoleon starts using paintings and newspapers and so forth to encourage the French to be loyal to to his rule. Also, Napoleon's rule is going to result in the changing of military tactics. We've discussed the increasing importance of artillery and also the sort of increased importance of tactical flexibility. It's no longer just sort of lining up two armies and hammering on each other until one side gives in, which was the very sort of old school, very gentlemanly way to fight, the honorable way. Napoleon starts doing all these crazy things like attacking people on their flanks and using deception and all that sort of thing. And, you know, he's very, uh, and not to say that people weren't doing that before, but Napoleon is really a master of these new tactics. And that's, that's really going to sort of change the way uh, that, things are being done in France, but abroad as well. Now, meanwhile, at home, you know, Napoleon really is uh, being very, very active domestically as well. Uh, in 1807, he dissolves most of the legislative bodies uh, that, as he saw it, got in his way, got in the way of his, his, his rule, and starts relying more and more on these sort of talented young bureaucrats that are, are being promoted. His system uh, when in both the army and in the bureaucracy of, of finding talented young people and promoting them is leading to a great deal of social mobility in France, which uh, made him very popular with the, with the middle classes. Uh, and so as a result, even though Napoleon reinstitutes noble titles and starts sort of doling them out uh, to people who have served him well, he is creating a society that, rather than being based on blood, which you'll remember, the, you know, he was sort of mocked as a child for not being um, not being noble enough and and not being rich enough and everything. Uh, instead of being based on on sort of blood. Uh, really, European society uh, un, in these areas that are controlled by Napoleon is is now much more based on sort of wealth and and talent, uh, and we're going to see that that's going to be a trend that's going to continue into the 19th century. The the age of the the dominance of the blue-blooded monarchs and the houses of lords and all that sort of thing is really on its on its way out, and you know the the educated middle class is, is now a much larger force, certainly in French politics, and it's starting to sort of spread elsewhere as well. He also creates a central national bank to facilitate control of the national debt, which obviously during the period of the revolution had gotten very badly out of control. Uh, that's not really true. It was already out of control under the Bourbon. Uh, he starts taxing trade much in the same way that the Bourbon monarchs did. He established schools called the Lycée, L-Y-C-E-E, -E. uh, and those schools were there not only to, to sort of fight illiteracy, but also, again, to serve as centers of propaganda, to promote patriotism amongst 
the amongst the people because education uh, is a very important way to establish a citizen's worldview. He also establishes the first public university in Paris. Mm. Uh, perhaps most importantly, though, Napoleon establishes a new law code. Like uh, Emperor Justinian, he finds himself in a position looking at a French legal system, which, like the Roman system under Justinian, was just an absolute mess. It was horribly disorganized. These various constitutions that had been written by the National Assembly and by the Directory and by the Committee of Public Safety, there are a lot of overlapping rules. There are a lot of uh, things that sort of cancel each other out and it didn't really align very well. And so he has a whole bunch of French lawyers sit down and codify this into one big law code. It's actually over 2,000 uh, items long. So it's big. Uh, but at least it's well organized. Um, and and in, in many ways, it uh, it took a lot of the gains that the French Revolution had made and 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 sort of um, put them put them down on on paper once and for all. Now, that's not to say that it was necessarily particularly egalitarian. There were very few rights for workers. Workers were not allowed to strike. Also, women had no control of family property. It was very difficult for them to divorce. They didn't have very many legal rights, and Napoleon certainly uh, was not particularly high thinking when it when it came to the position of women in, in, in European society. He supposedly referred to them as nothing more than machines for producing children. Um, but in spite of that, it is a it is a big game changer because it emphasizes that end to social distinction by birth. Uh, it uh, as it spreads through various parts of Europe, as you know, Napoleon carries it with him when he goes with his army. It dissolves feudalism and serfdom in a lot of Central and Eastern European states. Um, and, and so it is a, a very big sort of modernizing move that's taking place during this period from, say, 1807 to about 1812 or so. Okay. Uh, meanwhile, he also divorces Josephine, and he marries a Habsburg princess from Austria who, within the first year of their marriage, manages to give him the son that he wanted as an heir, that Josephine, who uh, by the time he divorced her at age 46, was simply not going to be able to provide. So at this point, we should probably in some ways begin to see, see Napoleon as kind of an enlightened despot, like a Frederick the Great or a Catherine the Great. He's got this large empire, he's expanding, he's got a powerful uh, bureaucracy, he has a powerful standing army to, to aid him. He is sort of shoring up his rule with uh, patronage of the arts and that, that sort of thing. He is reforming the law, uh, but he's also very authoritarian. He's very much in charge. And so, uh, again, people can have liberty and freedom and all those things as long as it doesn't interfere with my right to rule. And this is where, this is where the trouble really starts. A lot of it goes back to Napoleon's just undying hatred of, of the British and his desire to see them shut down. So you remember that he's, he's got control over all of these territories, and he starts to try and enforce this continental system, which basically means that no French merchants and no merchants from countries that are sort of allied with France, which again is pretty much everyone, uh, nobody is allowed to trade with Britain. And he did that to sort of cut them off from their markets in Europe, but also to hopefully encourage the development of French industry that can then replace the British ones. Now, here's the problem. Britain, by this point, has a very large overseas empire. We've still got territories in Canada. We've still got territories in India. And so, yes, this hurts the British economically, but because they're already industrialized, because they already have all these foreign markets, they're able to sort of squeeze by. It's really going to hurt Napoleon's uh, economy and that of his allies. And, and what we're going to see is that even in France, smugglers are going to start uh, sort of sneaking British goods into the country and selling them because the French industry just cannot get up fast enough to, to keep pace with the demand. And so it really causes economic ruin. And people start refusing to comply. And the first, the first people that Napoleon decides to go after for this is Portugal. Portugal is a long-standing ally of the British, actually going all the way back to the 12th century. 
So he secures rights to march his troops through Spain to Portugal. But then while he's on his way through Spain, there's basically a, uh, a sort of tumult within the Spanish government. Uh, uh, there's a group that is attempting to get the, the monarch to step down and to replace him with his son Ferdinand. Ferdinand asks Napoleon for support, and Napoleon basically uses that as an opportunity to go in and just flat out occupy Spain. This is in 1808 that he, he begins to occupy Spain. Um, and he's thinking, you know what, the Spanish are going to welcome the opportunity to be involved in all these great things that I'm doing and to be liberated from their sort of uh, the, the corrupt Catholic clergy and the nobles and all that sort of thing. But he underestimated Spanish nationalism. And so very quickly, even though he's able to defeat the Spanish army, uh, Spanish soldiers and, and locals start forming these guerrilla bands and sort of attacking French supplies and, and, and you know, sniping at the French when they're marching through th cities and that sort of thing, and start staging this guerrilla war. And actually, that's where we get the term, is this, uh, this Spanish word guerrilla um, for these people who are fighting against Napoleon. And there are a great deal of atrocities committed on both sides. This is a very famous painting where we see uh, some French soldiers executing uh, these Spanish guerrillas, and obviously they look very, uh, very humble, and 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 you know it makes makes the French look very mean indeed. But but certainly the guerrillas were were you know killing a number of the French soldiers as well, and and doing some pretty pretty nasty things to them. So on both sides, these atrocities are being committed. And meanwhile. The British, who up to this point have not actually had a land army on the continent, they've been sort of uh, letting everybody else fight it out and, and focusing on the naval side of things, which, by the way, made the Austrians and the Russians very angry because they felt like they were sort of getting bled dry by Napoleon while the British were just kind of hanging out. Um, the British take an expeditionary force from Britain. They land in Portugal, and they're mostly under the command of, of uh, Arthur Wellesley, the future Duke of Wellington, who turns out to be a very capable general. And they start so slowly, with the aid of the Portuguese and these guerrillas, pushing the, uh, the French out of Spain. And as they're doing that, you know, Arthur Wellesley is sort of reforming the army. Uh, this is sort of Britain's training ground where they're going to learn how to fight a new modern Napoleonic army and when really they're going to begin sort of the British army's ascendancy that they're going to maintain really for the rest of the 19th century. Okay. Uh, now, uh, so Napoleon has these troops in Spain. They're fighting to keep the Spanish and the Portuguese from rebelling and from uh, participating in trade with Britain, and this actually became known as Napoleon's Spanish ulcer. It kept many of his best troops, uh, about 200,000 of them in fact, tied up in Spain where uh, they could not be available for his other ventures. And the next thing he does is in 1812, because the Russians, who are supposed to be allied with him, have started breaking away and trading with the British, he says, all right, I'm going to invade Russia. So we're already, we're already at war in Spain, now we're going to be at war in Russia too, which as you can see is a long way away. It's about 1,500 miles um, from his, you know, the center of his supply and everything in, in, in Paris. So it's a long way away. Now Napoleon uh, took an enormous army with him into, into Russia, somewhere around 600,000 men. Some of them were French, some of them were from his other allies, Austria, Prussia, uh, Italy, and, and so forth and so on. And he seems to have thought that uh, he'd be able, essentially, to uh, to win a very quick victory. Supposedly, he told one of his generals that the war with Russia will not last longer than 20 days. And so he crosses the border and starts marching into the Russian interior. But amazingly, or at least to Napoleon, the Russian army refused to actually fight him. Uh, Tsar Alexander says, you know what, we're just going to, we're going to pull them into the country and we're going to burn everything as we go. And so they pursue this scorched earth policy where they are essentially, uh, you know, burning the area in front of Napoleon so that as he comes on, he cannot have the supplies and the shelter that he needs for his troops to live off the land. And so very quickly, he starts sort of losing men. Um, and he does finally get the Russians to fight him in September uh, at the Battle of Borodino. 
Um, but the Russians just have this dogged determination to hold on, and, and, and he's never able to fully drive them from the field. Eventually they retreat at the end of the day, uh, but not before 68,000 men have been killed on both sides. And then as Napoleon is marching into the city of Moscow, Alexander cuts all of the felons loose out of the jail and says, hey, uh, as long as you guys just go around, around with torches and set the city of Moscow on fire, you can, you can go free. And so they burn the city of Moscow as Napoleon is arriving in it and sort of, again, deny him the sort of supplies and the shelter that he needs. And so Napoleon is just astounded. You know, why on earth, after I've sort of taken one of their most important cities, after I've driven their army back, why are the Russians not surrendering? Why are they not suing for peace? And so he waits for five weeks in Moscow for uh, Tsar Alexander to come to him with a peace offering that, that never shows up. And so finally he goes, well, I can't keep campaigning. I'm way too far away from my supplies. We've got to get home. Winter is coming. And so Napoleon turns his men around and starts marching them back. Unfortunately, uh, as he goes back, winter comes early. And with particular ferocity, the temperature dips very sharply uh, to about, you know, negative 38 uh, it's exceedingly cold, and a number of his men die of either starvation or of uh, of hypothermia as they are crossing back through Russia to get back to France. And so of that enormous army that he took with him, 600,000 men, only about 40 or 50,000 of them make it home. And, and it's really a, a, a terrible moment for, for Napoleon. His, uh, his army, or pardon me, his allies, Prussia, Austria, desert him and, and join Russia and Britain, and this you know new combined army starts marching its way east through Europe towards France. Napoleon loses a large battle to them at Leipzig uh, in 1813, and then despite the fact that he has some more victories, he's just not able to stem the tide having had those enormous losses. And by now, the French people are going, you know, we were okay with this guy having all this power when he was winning, but now that all of these soldiers are dying in Spain and in Russia, and now we're being invaded by these other countries, you know, Napoleon is not is not appealing to us as much as he once was. And so, when Tsar Alexander I and King Frederick William III of Prussia enter Paris in March of 1814, uh, Napoleon's generals and and bureaucrats basically say listen, you're going to have to give up the throne because the French people are not going to support you anymore. So Napoleon is forced to, abdic uh, is forced to abdicate, and he is sent into exile in the island of Elba, which is in sort of the, the central Mediterranean here near Italy. <clears throat> and in his place, the uh, various monarchies of Europe put uh, a Bourbon, the brother of Louis XVI, Louis XVIII, they put him on the throne, and the French people aren't necessarily crazy about having a king, but you know what? At least the war is over. At least we're getting some stability uh, back. You know, we're not going back to sort of the awful days of the revolution. So everybody in Europe is, if not happy, then, you know, contented. It was like, well, you know, this isn't the best of situations, but Napoleon's gone. We've restored the monarchy in France. Every, you know, we're at peace. Everything's okay. Okay. Uh, the problem is... Louis XVIII gets rather high-handed um, as he is uh, as he is functioning as as the King of France. He keeps some of the revolutionary liberties, but he brings back the Bourbon flag instead of the revolutionary tricolor. He starts reaffirming all the rights of the divine monarchy. He starts giving land back to all those immigrate uh, immigrate nobles, which angers the people, and so. When Napoleon escapes from Elba in March of 1815 and uh, returns to France, uh, the army rejoins him, the people are supporting him again, and basically France sort of jubilantly calls him to, to, retake, the, uh, to retake the crown as, as emperor. Now, the rest of Europe is not going to have this. They, we've had too many problems with Napoleon already. And so all of these countries declare war just against Napoleon, not against France, but against Napoleon himself. And they start raising these enormous armies, 700,000 men in total from all over Europe to come and invade France. Napoleon says, okay, the only way I'm going to be able to pull this off is I've got to take the army that I have, which is about 100,000 men, give or take, 
and I am going to have to invade Belgium, which is where the Prussian and British armies were. I need to defeat the Prussians, and then I need to defeat the British, and basically convince the Russians and the Austrians that I'll be able to defeat them too, and get everybody to sort of sue for peace and get this over with quickly. So he marches up into Belgium. <clears throat> And pardon me while we go down here and switch maps. This, by the way, is a very famous image of Napoleon's retreat from Russia, which I forgot to show you. And then this uh, this graphic that demonstrates sort of the size of the army as it you know crosses the border, and then you know Borodino, Moscow, and then on the way back. Um, anyway. So uh, we're getting we're getting back to uh, we're getting back to Napoleon's return to France after he kicks out Louis XVIII, who very quickly retreats uh, and and sort of leaves the country basically because he knows he can't handle Napoleon. So Napoleon marches uh, towards uh, Brussels in Belgium, and they fight this battle at Waterloo. And basically, uh, the Duke of Wellington, who remember hasn't actually fought Napoleon, but he's been fighting all of Napoleon's generals in Spain for about seven years uh, and has learned a great deal about about sort of defense pardon me defensive warfare uh, arrays himself on the top of this hill Napoleon uh, is then forced to sort of attack up this hill um, he had already beaten the Prussians but he hadn't destroyed the Prussian army and part of his army was actually over here sort of chasing the uh, chasing the Prussians around the Prussians circled back around and as Napoleon is is trying in vain to sort of drive the British off of this hill, the Prussians show back up right as uh, Wellington's troops are getting ready to sort of crack under the pressure, and Napoleon is defeated. And, and actually, if you ever get a chance, I would recommend that you look more deeply into the Battle of Waterloo. There's been a movie made about it. There have been a number of uh, sort of documentaries, most of which are all on, on YouTube that have been made about it. It, it. It's a pretty fascinating story, and unfortunately, we don't have time to really sort of dig into it here. <clears throat> so after after all of this, after he's defeated by the British General Wellington and the Prussian General uh, Gerhard von Blücher, uh, they all sort of agree that uh, you know Napoleon has has got to go, and they actually erected this enormous monument at Waterloo. They dug up all this turf and made this sort of fake hill and put this lion, uh, British lion, on it with its paw on the globe, looking towards France. Uh, just as a as a reminder to those those dirty French types that you know if they ever try this again here's what's going to happen. So Napoleon is forced to abdicate a second time, and this time they exile him to the island of Saint Helena in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, a bajillion miles away from anyone who uh, would be able to help him escape. And uh, he is he is basically forced to live out the last six years of his life there sort of constantly uh, wondering what, what might have been, and, and he spends all of his time sort of going back over all of his battles and, and, and so forth, and not really with a great deal to do. So, real quick, since this is getting to be a pretty long podcast, um, legacies of, of Napoleon's rule. First of all, uh, Napoleon is going to sort of reshape Europe, not only politically, but militarily. Uh, the armies are going to be much sort of more um, organized after after Napoleon. They're going to the, the way that they supply themselves is is going to change. Uh, and you know the, this notion of the levee en masse and and the increasing industrialization in Europe is going to mean that a lot of these European states are capable of producing much larger armies, which are equipped with more modern weapons. And it also means that sort of the military ethos is going to become incredibly important in uh, in the society of many of these European countries, particularly since a lot of the hereditary nobility has decreased in importance. Um, being able to say that you're an officer in the army then becomes a very you know important part of a, a family's social position. Uh, in addition to that, Napoleon spreads this Napoleonic code throughout Europe as he as he is doing these conquests. And so um, a lot of European states are going to, after Napoleon, be forced to incorporate elements of that into their legal system. In fact, it is still the basis of the French law code today, but it is also going to encourage the development, the spread of some of those revolutionary ideas into places like Italy and Germany and so forth and so on. And that's going to form the basis for a lot of new constitutions in those places. Um, so in that sense, he's sort of a son of the revolution. 
he encourages social mobility, the spread of these revolutionary ideals, the nationalism that's being spread through the schools that he established in France, and then obviously people in Spain and Germany sort of opposing Bonaparte, who are then going to start to yearn for these new sort of united states, uh, or, well, united countries, I should say, that are going to have these very strong senses of national pride. Um, <clears throat> Also, it paves the way for a lot of the revolutions in uh, South and Central America because they are all colonies of Spain. Spain is too busy fighting Bonaparte to really focus on the administration of the colonies, and it's going to sort of leave room for those revolutions to happen. Uh, and then perhaps finally, we have the Congress of Vienna, at which all of these uh, ambassadors sort of get together. It, it's very much like the Treaty of Westphalia. We've had this huge series of wars that have been involved. All of Europe has killed all these people. We need to figure out a peace settlement that's going to be um, that's going to be something that everybody can get along with, so that we can restore the balance of power and and you know not have to go to war again in another five years. And the balance of power, again, like Westphalia, is really the driving force behind the way that the treaty is written up. We give more land to Prussia and Austria. Uh, Britain becomes the largest empire in the world. About one-fifth of the world's population is living under the British. The Russians get some land out of it. But um, in between a lot of these great countries, in between, for example, France and Prussia, in between Prussia and Russia, we're establishing these small border states, like some of those kingdoms in the Rhine, some of the uh, you know, like territories in Poland are being set up as these buffer states to sort of prevent these major powers from being able to lock horns with one another. We're going to try and separate them from each other so that we can prevent some of the fighting. We also put monarchies back, even if they're sort of now more egalitarian constitutional monarchies, we put monarchies back in place in all of the various uh, territories. And this is really going to set up <clears throat> this uh, fight between conservatism and liberalism that is going to dominate European politics really for the next 100 years. And we'll see plenty of examples of that as we go on. Anyway, thank you students for bearing with me, and I will be back uh, with you at some point with another podcast. See you later.